Hi guys, it's Mr. Vandergriff and I'm here with Lesson 1.2, Ecology Field Trip and Developing and Asking Questions. Before we get into the lesson, um, I wanted to encourage you to give someone an unexpected phone call. So we've been stuck inside for a while, sheltering in place, um, doing our social distancing, but it doesn't mean we need to um, socially isolate. And so again, with your parents' permission, go ahead and give maybe a relative or a fr family friend or friend you haven't talked to in a long time, just give them a call. I know it's great to get an unexpected phone call and hear a voice for someone that you haven't talked to in a long time. Last night, I did exactly that, and I called one of my friends um, that I went to college with that's a movie producer, and we haven't talked in months, and it was great to get caught up, see what his kids were up to, and he asked about how my kids were doing as well. So again, with your parents' permission, go ahead and um, give someone a, a phone call that maybe they weren't expecting, and just check in with them and see how they're doing. Now, some of you might also be thinking, what's that picture of? Yeah, that's called a rotary telephone. And when I was in middle school, that's the exact phone we had at our house. All right, now let's get into the lesson. And here are our learning intentions. All seventh grade students will develop scientific investigative questions from their observations from their visit to an outdoor ecosystem space. The success criteria is what you should be able to do after the lesson. So this is what you should be able to do. I can develop three to four scientific investigative questions from my observations. I can identify if my questions are testable or not. And I can classify my questions into one of the seven NGSS cross-cutting concepts. All right, now for our science journal. So go ahead and get something to write with, uh, whether it's your science journal or even a blank piece of paper or your packet. And you're going to be writing uh, regarding this question here. How did your ecology field trip go? What types of plants and wildlife did you observe? Uh, what about the non-living things that were in the environment that you were observing? Give some detail. So go ahead and pause the video right now and just be writing for two minutes, please. Go ahead and pause that video and answer that question. All right, now that I'm back, um, hopefully you were able to reflect on how your field trip went. So mine went great. I think I just picked the wrong time of day. It was just a little hot at, I think it was like 1230 in the afternoon. So it was, I was baking out there. So uh, probably would have been a better choice to do it more in the later afternoon or maybe in the early morning. I have this picture of this bobcat because on our property, one time, one time, there was this magical moment where it's up by the garage. I looked over and sure enough, I saw a bobcat with two kittens. And they were probably maybe 10 meters from me, about 30 feet. We stared at each other. I didn't move. And for about 30 seconds to maybe 60 seconds, it stared at me. The kittens played around the mom's feet, mother's feet there, and then just slowly walked off. And it was just so cool. I've never since seen a bobcat on our property, but it was really, really cool. But again, I get just as excited seeing some really cool insect or pepsin wasp, or tarantula, or red-tailed hawk. You know, I just love the outdoors. So hopefully you had a great experience. Now you want to get your developing and using models uh, handout. So make sure you pull that out. And um, I did make a video. Obviously, I'm not gonna. We're not gonna watch this whole thing here. But um, hey guys, it's Mr. Van here. This is my video here of me kind of modeling how I wanted you to make your observations. So. How many of you watched that video? All right, great. You know, it took a little while to make it, so I'm glad. Um, hopefully it helped. Let's see. 50 yards. Yeah, I'm just kind of doing the boundary here. Then I'm writing down. How many sticks? One, two, so three, So I'm four, counting, five, six, so I'm giving seven, eight, quantitative observations. I just um, see a little. Looking at the different plants. Yeah, there's some lichen on the branches there. And some flies. Yep. Yeah. There we go. It's a bunch of little black flies. That's kind of cool. I like this little bee shot. I need to get one of those micro lenses on my iPhone to kind of zoom in on stuff. There's a laurel leaf sumac plant, other known and as the taco plant. So anyway, hopefully there's some little lichen at kind of the end right there and then that hole in the ground. All right. So after my observation for 30 minutes, this is what my, these are all my observations that I had written down. 
So again, remember that you put the phenomena as just the 30 minutes of observing the ecosystem you were in, and then your boundary, mine was about 50 yards by 50 yards by 50 yards. And then you can see all these different things that I was observing, whether it was a fly or a small beetle or a bee, I think it was a bee, a white butterfly. Um, I could hear a chainsaw, a plane was flying overhead, uneven terrain, large rocks, fi uh, fine sand, like sand. Um, there was a lichen on a stick. You can see seven bees over here. Um, there was a hole here. There's some dead leaves. There I am sitting. That's kind of where I was with my pen and my observations. So here were all of the components where it says draw and label the components. And then the next is I needed to identify the relationships between everything that I made my observations on. So see, here's just a couple relationships I found. So the plants, the relationship, they need sunlight so they can photosynthesize. They need water. They need CO2 from the air that they breathe in their leaves through this, the stomata so they can make um, glucose, right? They need soil, right? They can get the minerals and the water out of there and a place to put their roots down. Squirrels, um, they're going to need some shade or a hole for shelter or obviously water and, and plants as well or maybe insects to feed on. Insects are going to need places to hide or shelter. Plants, flowers, that could be relationships there, a bee relationship, the, the pollen that I saw that the bee was collecting, the, there's nectar, there's food sources. Uh, the bees could be a food source for another animal, so a resource population, right? And then I put birds up here, trees. They need trees for shelter so they can make a nest, right? They need water, insects possibly to eat, lichen. They need rocks or a stick to cling to, right? To have a place to set up camp, right? To, to live, to shelter. Um, water branches. So these are just a couple of the relationships I identified on number four. All right. And then last, I just did an explanation of my model of what was taking place in my chaparral ecosystem. So I'll just read what I put. I observed the chaparral ecosystem. Plants and animals here need to ad adapt to harsh conditions like intense sunlight, lack of moisture, water, and frequent wildfires. Since I've lived in Ramona, there's been two major wildfires that have gone through Ramona. We actually shut school down, I think it was in 2003 and 2007. Each came about a mile, mile and a half from my house. We were very fortunate. We knew people that did lose their home. We were very fortunate those wildfires didn't um, destroy or damage our property. Many of the animals are active in the morning um, or evening when the heat is not as intense. Uh, many plants have adapted to the harsh conditions by developing waxy surfaces on their leaves. Some also uh, close up to reduce the surface area exposed to the sun at probably the most intense part of the day. So that was just kind of an explanation of my <clears throat> observations and some of the relationships I saw. All right. Now, what I'd like you to do is I want you to take five minutes. I really want you to do this. I want you to pause the video and just read over every single observation that you made. Just read it out loud. Yes, you know, like sunlight, full intense rays, honeybee, I saw seven going from flower to flower. Like read every single one and then read over these relationships, okay? Go ahead and pause the video and review your observations of the components of your model. All right, so hopefully you can unpause it now. And what I'd like you to do now is write the word non-living down here and put abiotic. Now, if you have a red marker, that'd be great. But if you don't, not a big deal. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting circles around anything that is not living. Non-living or scientifically we call that abiotic. A meaning without, biotic meaning life. So without life, non-living. All right. So for instance, I circled the sun here or this large rock that um, I was sitting on, or the clouds. I looked up and there was some few clouds. They're part of the environment, but again, they're not living. Uh, the dirt's not living, although things in the dirt could be living. Uh, slight breeze or wind, right? It's not living, but it is part of the ecosystem there. I heard a chainsaw, so that wasn't living. I heard the sound of a chainsaw, another large rock, some uh, uh, the soil I noticed was very very dry and, and it was lacking moisture. 
All right, the lights are going off of my room, so I had to do a little dance to get the lights to turn back on. So soil, very dry. Uh, large, another large rock. Uh, I heard an airplane flying overhead. Scat or not, um, animal fecal matter, right? Nitrogenous waste product or animal poo, right? Scat. Um, then we've got some shade of that rock and then some shade from that tree over there. Um, and then we had sand-like fine soil and then full intense rays of the sun. Uh, minerals in the soil, I could see that. And uh, uneven terrain, so it wasn't just flat. And then holes in the ground. So those are all abiotic factors, right? Abiotic factors of the things that I was observing. So go ahead and pause the video and make sure that you put a circle around every abiotic factor or component of your model of the ecosystem that you observe. So go ahead and pause the video right now. All right, now that I'm back, I'm curious if, did you have more than me? Uh, or did you have, maybe you had less, maybe you had about the same. Um, but if you really think about it, there's a lot there. Some I forgot, it would be oxygen or air, even air, or carbon dioxide, nitrogen in the air. So again, these are invisible, but they're still there and they're a part of the ecosystem. Um, even like the humidity, the amount of water that's in the air will make a difference of what plants can possibly live in that ecosystem. All right, now what I'd like you to do is write down here living or biotic. Biotic meaning living. So right here, and we're gonna put a square around all of the living components of the ecosystem in green. If you have a green marker pen, that'd be great. If not, just put a box around it. So I've got the California buckwheat there. I've got a brown bird in a tree here, a fly over here, and some bees here, and flowers here. Uh, what did I have here? Lichen over here, small bee here, scrub jay here, Ants, a lot of red ants, harvester ants, large crow flying overhead, red-tailed hawk, white butterfly. Uh, I heard a lot of different birds chirping in the distance. And lizard here. What else do I have? Anything else? That might be it. Uh, there's something else, but I can't. So this plant over here, I think that was a lower leaf sumac plant. All right. So go ahead and make sure you... Pause the video and put a square about around everything that was biotic or living in your ecosystem. Go ahead and pause the video. All right, I'm back. Um, again, hopefully put squares around everything that was uh, living. All right, now I want to bring you back to our learning intention. Remember that it was to develop scientific investigative questions from your observations. And it's extremely important that we learn how to ask questions. The goal of a good science class is to get students to be able to ask their own questions. Because if you learn how to ask your own questions, you're going to become a lifelong learner. You're going to be curious about things. And as you ask questions and as you begin to wonder, you're learning. And that's really cool. So I wanted to model this with this core sample um, core soil sample field trip that we did a couple years ago in my seventh grade science class. So I sent the students out and what they were supposed to do is to collect a core sample, make detailed observations, and develop investigative questions. They needed to collect a core sample, make some observations, identify things if they were biotic or abiotic, and then again develop the scientific questions. And we were doing this with our um, I think it was with the performance expectation about natural resources and how they are unequally distributed around the world. So we were going out in the soil and pulling out um, core samples to see what was in that soil. Believe it or not, your cell phone, pretty much everything in your cell phone comes from the ground, whether it's the gold or the silicon or the tungsten or the aluminum or even you think any plastic on there from the oil, right? the petrol that's coming from the ground. So again, our natural resources. So we sent our student geologists out to um, get a core sample and gave them the guidelines so they were safe out there, having fun. You can see them here collecting 
Let's take a look here. So there's a lot of activity. It's really cool when you actually get to do science and not just learn about science. You actually participate in it. So um, some, I was surprised, didn't really even know how to use a hammer and needed a little help. Keep going. <clears throat> some were a little more proficient, a little more eye hand coordination. But most students were, each group was able to get a core sample. And then from that core sample, we walked it back carefully, brought it back into the classroom so we could analyze the data. Again, remember, analyzing data um, is going to be a science and engineering practice. That's all scientists do. So they were able sifting through that, finding out what was going on, looking with their phone, zooming in with things, using magnets to see if they could find any metallic substances in there. All right? I have a couple video clips. Let me just show you. <laughs> Oh no, it's a foxtail. Is it really? Yeah, these things, it's not a real foxtail. It goes into like your sock and it gets stuck in there. Okay. These, that's how they actually travel. They get stuck and then they, like, they usually get stuck into animals' paws and then they get released. Okay, so that would be non. It's living. It's a living seed. So the more detailed their observations, it's really going to help them be able to develop um, really good questions here. Uh, I'll leave you with this last observation here. Um, I found charcoal, iron, pyrite, small rocks, small twigs, small pieces of grass, and sand. How do you know what pyrite is? Um, well, um, I think it was in fifth grade. I learned about minerals. the minerals and um, that pyrite. It looks like gold, but it's not gold. And it's I don't think there's gold on the backfield. So. All right, thank you, Connor. Now, getting back to, they did really good observations, right? They collected their sample. They went out there to do their investigation. They analyzed the data by looking through, making qualitative and quantitative observations. And then I asked them, get some time to develop some questions. So here's the questions that they came up with. Go ahead and listen to Jenny. Um, my question was, if iron is normally found deeper in soil, why was it there so much on the surface? Um, here's Zoe's question. My question was, why was there clay in the soil, and if we could like compare it to other soil around us to see if there's any other clay in other soil. Well, let's see what we got How here. How far do you have to get the pipe in order to have an encounter with roots and or other living organisms? And let's see what Isabel has. My question is, how come like the deeper you went into the soil, the more moist it got? And we think it might be because the sun can go on the, it can heat up the top, so it doesn't go into the soil where it's warm. And Jessica. Our question was, if pyrite is magnetic, and if not, why? And I think that's our last question. Uh, where did the charcoal come from, and like how old is it, and where where was it? Because there, there were no trees near where we got the core sample. So now students could set up investigations to answer the question or possibly do some more research to find out the answers to their questions. And that's when some of the most powerful learning takes place. So now it's going to be your chance to do this. So again, if you go in the back of your packet, you should be able to see handout that looks like this. It says asking questions and I just put at the top for my phenomena, my ecosystem was dirt patch in the chaparral. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to model me asking some questions and then I'm going to give you a chance to do that. So one question I came up with, are bees more attracted to the California buckwheat or the laurel leaf sumac flowers? I had another question, what caused the large hole in the ground? Does any animal live in a large hole in the ground? Are lichen found more on the surface of rocks or tree branches? Another question, why are most leaves covered with a waxy substance? Are there more California buckwheat or laurel leaf sumac plants in the area I was observing? And how many rosy boa snakes can be supported in this small area? So again, on our property, we found three rosy boa snakes over the last, oh, I don't know, as long as we've lived there. They're gorgeous in uh, indigenous uh, boa constrictor. 
Uh, there's only two bow constrictors, I believe, in all of the United States. I know in California, there's the rubber boa, which in the San Bernardino Mountains, I know they're up there. I've never seen a rubber boa. And then we've got the rosy boa um, here, um, and they're gorgeous, beautiful snakes. They're very docile. Um, so again, I've seen them on our property, but I'm just curious how many in that area could that support? Even though I can't see them, are they there? Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to know, are these testable? Could we set up an experiment or an investigation to answer that question? And for the first one, I would say definitely yes. Um, we, could set up, we could set up a camera, a motion sensor. We could sit there one hour a day and, and collect data and count which bees are visiting uh, which plants. What caused the large hole in the ground? No, you really probably can't set up an investigation for that. Um, the next one, does any animal live in the large hole? Yeah, we probably could do an investigation for that. Again, with another motion sensor camera, set that up and see if a squirrel's coming out of there or a tarantula or a snake. Um, are lichen found more on the surface of rocks or trees? Absolutely, you could set up an investigation for that one. That is testable. Why are most leaves covered with a waxy surface? Um, no, you can't really set up an investigation to come up with an answer for that. Are there more California buckwheat or laurel leaf sumac plants? Um, yeah, that you can definitely um, do a survey, do a sample, population sample of those plants like we were talking about with the moon jellies, how they were doing samples with that or with the orange belly parrot as well. So we could do a sample um, sample size or selection or survey with these plants. And so I would say yes. And then last, how many rosy boa snakes can be supported in this small area? So I'd say absolutely you could find out, you could set up an investigation, you could test that. Now the last thing is we want to classify the questions that you've come up with. And we want to classify them according to the cross-cutting concepts. So remember that cross-cutting concepts are how scientists think about things. Science is about observing natural phenomena, right? and doing investigations and query, right? Like looking into things because we're curious, like what's causing that tornado? What's causing that hurricane? What's causing these earthquakes, okay? So in our science class, we do science. So when the students were going and collecting, right, they were doing an investigation. So that is what scientists do. Those are called science practices, science and engineering practices. And then the actual content we're learning would be our discipline core ideas, the DCI. But the cross-cutting concepts are how scientists think and you're thinking scientifically. So let me just model this for you, all right? So are bees more attracted to the California buckwheat or the laurel leaf sumac? So that I'm looking for a pattern, a pattern of behavior in the bees and where they're visiting. What caused the large hole in the ground? What cross-cutting concept would that be? Absolutely, it's gonna be cause and effect. The effect is the hole in the ground, but what was the cause? What, what, what created the hole? Does any animal live in the large hole in the ground? What's that one gonna be? So that's, again, a pattern question. So we wanna know the pattern of which animals are living in there, looking for behavioral patterns. Are lichen found more on the surface of rocks or tree branches? What one's that gonna be? Again, yep, another pattern question. Why are most leaves covered with a waxy surface? So think of what that is. Yeah, absolutely, that's correct. So it's gonna be structure and function. So the actual structure is the waxy surface on the leaves, but what's the function? What's the job of that waxy surface? Are there more California buckwheat or laurel leaf sumac plants? So that's another pattern question. And then how many rosy boa snakes can be supported in this small area? So again, I kind of struggle with that one, but I did come up with, that could be an energy and matter because again, you're, the rosy boas are going to need to consume a certain amount of, like, let's say, wood rats. And in those wood rats, they're going to have energy storage molecules in their body and they're going to get their energy to survive, right? To do all the things they need to do as a snake and reproduce. Okay, so that's going to be the energy and matter. So that's going to be the flow of energy and matter. But also it could be maybe um, quantity and proportion, scale and proportion, uh, or maybe system and system matters or system models. So within the system, 
how many snakes are in there. But again, it might be the proportion and quantity one as well. But I chose this one would be energy and matter. So hopefully this was helpful to model this for you of my questions. But again, this is one of a really important skill that we want. Oh, my lights are going out. I'm going to turn them back on. All right. Little motion sensors going to sleep. So I'm back. So hopefully this modeling kind of has helped out. Um, you think about and and give you some guidance in asking your own questions. So again, not all questions are good questions. Again, not all questions are scientific questions. So we want to develop um, a skill of asking questions and um, asking questions. So hopefully this was helpful to you. And now it is your turn to stop the video and go ahead and come up with your questions from your um, model. And then what we'd love you to do is take a picture of your model, take a picture of your questions with your phone if you can, and then go ahead and email those to Mr. Cranock or Mrs. Reynolds or Mr. Vandergriff. Email those to your science teachers. We would absolutely love to see your models and absolutely love to see the questions that you're developing. And of course, you're going to be turning those in uh, when you come to the school uh, and drop those off. But We'd love to see him um, sooner than later. And hopefully this lesson 1.2 was helpful.